Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jennifer Nash. I'm a professor in the Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies Department here at Duke University. And I have the pleasure of serving as the program's current director. It is my immense honor to welcome you all to the 16th annual Feminist Theory Workshop. <laughs> it's also really nice to look out and see so many faces that I have seen at earlier workshops. It's very cool. I was telling Kathy Weeks just a moment ago that in preparation for making these opening comments, I watched the previous 15 years of opening comments <laughs> on our YouTube channel. Uh, you know, you know how it is being a researcher. So at the very first feminist theory workshop in 2007, Robin Wiegman assured the audience, quote, we have issued our promise to many people that we will hold this event again next year, and we indeed will. I should say, it looked like it was a much smaller room than this one. And we have. For 16 years, we have hosted a wide array of leading feminist scholars, including Hortense Spillers, Lauren Berlant, Patricia J. Williams, Jose Munoz, Alondra Nelson, C. Riley Snorton, Catherine McKittrick, and Christina Crosby, to name just a few of the all-star lineup of feminist scholars who have come through. And we have also hosted thousands of students faculty and activists from around the world who have convened in Durham to grapple with the provocative challenges posed by the speaker's keynote addresses. And since 2021, when FTW became a fully hybrid event, we have also convened online, and you'll see some of that happening thanks to Tanya Rispoli, to allow more scholars from around the world to access the event and to engage with each other. The duration of this event is evidence of the ongoing demand for a space for thinking about feminist theories and their connections to something we might call political life. And that demand is only intensified now. We inhabit a moment marked by conditions those of us in this room know far too well. Critical race theory and intersectionality have become weaponized terms, taken up in some unrecognizable form by the right, they are now deployed as evidence of the saturation of college campuses by a demand for left ideological conformity. Concerted efforts to dismantle the institutional project of gender and sexuality studies, along with black studies and ethnic studies, have marked the work that we do as dangerous, as dangerous knowledge designed to indoctrinate students into so-called woke ideology. And yet, and also, the last few years, have been marked by profound evidence of the success of our institutional project. Myriad gender and sexuality studies departments and programs across the US have already hosted celebrations of their 50th anniversaries. Many more are scheduled for the coming year. We're planning to celebrate our 40th anniversary next school year. Thank you. <laughs> the journals Feminist Studies and Signs have also celebrated their 50th anniversaries. The Feminist Studies issue is already out. The Signs issue is coming. And they've collectively marked the importance of scholarly publishing venues dedicated to gender and sexuality studies to the vitality of the field. My very brief outline of the political conditions of the present gestures to some of the contradictions that have long marked academic feminism. We are comfortably or uncomfortably institutionalized and we are under attack. We are precarious and we wield power. We are at home in the institution and we are never at home in the institution. In the midst of this, the seemingly new conditions that mark our present and the persistence of violence that has long marked daily life, we have kept this workshop going. For 16 marches, we have gathered here. The keynotes and roundtable speakers have guided us through a rigorous interrogation of our feminist attachments and aspirations. An engaged, intellectually curious audience has asked hard questions, and an amazing roster of gender, sexuality, and feminist studies program directors have acted as stewards of this workshop. And here I tip my hat to Robin Wiegman, Ranji Khanna, who I saw a few minutes ago, and Allison, Ranji Khanna, and Allison, Priscilla Wald, and the incomparable Julie Alcott. So thank you for all of your work for the program. I, you, oh yeah. <laughs> I use the term steward to describe their work, our work, intentionally, thinking with black feminist political scientist Andre Marie Hancock, who imagines herself as, in her words, a steward of intersectionality. She tells us that stewards are, quote, 
entrusted with caring for valuables that they do not own. And that stewardship is about, quote, producing projects that hopefully leave scholars better equipped to engage in new knowledge production projects. Hancock inspires me to consider what it means to keep something going, to sustain something, through a model of care rather than ownership, through an ethic of collectivity rather than the individualistic celebrity model that, orga that organizes far too much of academic life. In other words, I want to treat the sustaining of a practice, a gathering, a workshop like this one, as a question for feminist thought. What are the practices of care, rigor, generosity, attention, and of course, labor that make possible the repeated act of coming together, that have made possible this repeated act of coming together? And here I'm also reminded of Christina Sharp's plea in In the Wake that, quote, thinking needs care. And how do we continue to forge space for experimentation so that each time we come together here, it is with, this, with the knowledge that this workshop might look or feel different. This workshop will be made and remade by those in this room and elsewhere, but it will, I hope, still live on, even if in a form that is unfamiliar to us. The Feminist Theory Workshop has persisted even as we, those of us in this room and those of us who have been in it before, have vastly different attachments to our shared object, feminist theory. In fact, those different attachments are precisely what has always given this event its charge and its dynamism. We come to this space from our distinct disciplinary and interdisciplinary locations, all of which have their own relationships to feminist theories, methods, and approaches. This means that we can assume no common language or shared approach. Instead, we must take care to unpack the words we use, and we must take the time to figure out how to say what it is that we mean. In some ways, I am marking how it is feminist theories in the plural rather than feminist theory in the singular that has always been the shared object of this workshop. I use the plural to think about how the workshop clear space or demand space for a proliferation of modes and forms of feminist thinking. The plural marks the various questions feminist theories pose and seek to learn to pose, and the at times incommensurabilities of those questions. So we come together here in and around our differing commitments and allegiances to various forms of feminist theoretical engagement, and yet, and still, we come together. As I say this, I'm reminded of Joshua Chambers Letson's beautiful 2018 book, After the Party, and his formulation of the party is, quote, a singular being made up of the many. This workshop is not a party, not yet, at least. <laughs> Stay for the reception and it might be. But what might it mean to think about the workshop as following Chambers Lesson, a space that is vibrant and engaging precisely because it is constituted by the singular and the many? What might it mean to name our distinctive and possibly quite different allegiances to feminist theories and to let those varied allegiances all live and breathe in this room side by side. As I say these words, I find that I'm also thinking of the canonical anthology, This Bridge Caught My Back, and its call for a polyvocal feminism that exposes its seams, its sites of friction and disconnections, its practices of revisions and rewriting, its constant remaking. Bridge tells us that nothing is resolved because feminist theory is an unresolved and unresolvable project of asking questions. What feminist theory promises us is the repeated act of coming together to publish another edition in the case of this Bridge Caught My Back, to hold another workshop in the case of the feminist theory workshop, or to collectively think. I also mark the plurality of feminist theories as a hallmark of this workshop to honor the field that is my intellectual home, black feminism. Thinking feminist theories calls me back to Barbara Christian's 1987 landmark essay, The Race for Theory. I see some nods <laughs> of recognition. You might remember that Christian tells us that she is writing in a moment when, quote, theory has become a commodity which helps determine whether we are hired or promoted in academic institutions. Worse, whether we are heard at all. But her commitments are different. She urges us, her readers, to attend to theorizing rather than capital T theory, because in her words, quote, people of color have always theorized, but in forms quite different from the Western form of abstract logic. 
And I am inclined to say, she says, she writes, that our theorizing is often in narrative forms, in the stories we create, in riddles and proverbs, in the play with language, since dynamic rather than fixed ideas seem more to our liking. Following Christian, I mark my own desire for a feminist theories workshop that holds space for the various forms that our theorizing takes, for writing and speaking in voices that sound like our own or that sound like the voices we are still learning to amplify. I'm interested in a feminist theories workshop that can speak about the riddle and the proverb, the rhyme and the verse, and that might even speak in those forms. This is a vision of a feminist theories workshop that can contend with what we learn about feminist theory in scholarly journals and on Instagram, in monographs and on Twitter. What I'm saying here is that I hope that we can be deeply attentive to the public life of feminist theory without treating popular feminisms as poorly rendered facsimiles of ideas we continue to believe that we developed, or worse, that we own. By invoking Christian, I am also gesturing to something else. While this workshop has been organized around an object called feminist theory, there is no way for us to think theory or to do theory without a sustained attention to the politics of the theories we generate and deploy. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of, of teaching my brilliant students Adrian Rich's canonical politics of location essay. I am reminded of Rich's words, quote, theory can be a dew that rises from the earth and collects in the rain cloud and returns to earth over and over. But if it doesn't smell of the earth, it isn't good for the earth. What might it mean to forge feminist theories that are good for the earth? What might it mean to not yet know what kinds of feminist theories those are, but to return to that provocation as a kind of ethical touchstone? How might we travel with Rich's aspiration for a feminist theoretical project that is deeply material, highly specific, and fundamentally connected to the rhythms and the practices of the everyday? Feminist theorizing, to use Christian's term, calls us to contend with how feminist theory is a tool for survival and a blueprint for living or at least I think it should be. I find myself thinking about how feminist theories can be a tool for what Chambers Letson calls more life. I'm thinking about Sarah Ahmed's How to Live a Feminist Life that suggests that feminism is a life question and that feminist theory might give us tools for living differently. And I am also thinking with Kevin Quashie's provocation at last year's Black Feminist Theory Summer Institute where he said, quote, what if black feminism is supposed to teach us how to feel? Taken together, these scholars suggest that feminist theory's most urgent task and most profound aspiration might be to tell us something or some things about living and living on. I started by celebrating the fact that we have kept this workshop going, sustained it for 16 years. I don't mean to be romantic about institutions and especially, especially about elite private institutions. <laughs> Even as I note here that there is a democratic ethos that this workshop has long had, no cost to register, live streaming, a virtual platform, and a fully accessible archive of all of the talks that have, been, that have unfolded here on YouTube. There is no doubt after 16 years this workshop is an institutionalized practice. And like many other black feminists, I'm interested in what it means to produce what has been marked as outsider knowledge in the comfortable and at times uncomfortable space of the university. I'm interested in how feminist theories can help me and us navigate the contradictory places we find ourselves in, what it means to find home in the institution, what it means to forge feminist collectivity in Penn Pavilion at Duke University, with what it means to talk feminist politics over the swanky reception at six o'clock. <laughs> My hope is that our workshop this year can hold space for all this delicious complexity and paradox, that we might um, embrace uncertainty and not yet knowing as feminist ethics that we are always moving towards. So I wanna conclude with a few notes of gratitude before handing over the mic. It takes a lot of work to sustain an event of this scale each year. Every former director of GSF has told me that. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. You can find the long list of FTW co-sponsors on your program. And I wanna thank the many departments and programs here at Duke that have long been supporters and friends of our workshop. I particularly want to thank the Dean's Office and the Provost's Office for their support. Everything you see in this room, every detail, seems effortless, 
but it is actually the result of a tremendous and tireless effort of GSF's all-star staff. <laughs> <laughs> All three of the people that I am going to name are in my mind, the point guards in my world, okay? Just for those of you who are following March Madness. So I wanna recognize, celebrate, and applaud the labor of Julie Winmore, Jeremy Boomhauer, and Amanda Archambault. Their attention to big and small details makes these two days possible. And I am personally grateful for all the ways that they have made planning this event so fun. So thank you. I want to thank our other point guard and possibly power forward, Tanya Rispoli, for, ma for making the FTW accessible to more people by running the virtual side of our event. She has been at the center of making the virtual and the in-person spaces speak to each other meaningfully and seamlessly, and so I'm very grateful for her. I want to thank other GSF workers who have offered essential support these last few days including Kay Maldonado, Charlotte Joyner, and Anant Pratap Singh, who has done so much for us this last year. We appreciate you all. And I wanna thank the volunteers who lend their efforts to make the workshop run smoothly. And my final thank you is to my colleagues, the, the core faculty of Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies. FTW is a team effort, and it requires the time, energy, vision, and commitment of our whole faculty. So I wanna take a moment to honor my colleagues, many of whom are here today, Frances Hasso, Kimberly Lamb, Nikki Lane, Gabe Rosenberg, Kathy Rudy, Anna Storty, Kathy Weeks, and Ara Wilson, and express that it is a pleasure to be in community with you all. I hand the mic over to my colleague, Kimberly Lamb. Thank you. Hi everybody, nice to see some friendly faces here. <laughs> um, it's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Roderick Ferguson. Uh, before I do so, I, I just wanna take a moment to remember uh, Diane Nelson, uh, Professor of Culture and Anthropology and GSF at Duke. Uh, she brought great generosity of spirit to the Feminist Theory Workshop. She, she asked brave questions, sometimes she sang. <laughs> um, she made it a point to be kind. She, you know, she was tough and gentle, and she kind of she. I hate speaking about her in the past tense. Um, she embodied this kind of spirit of the '60s and the '70s, and it's really hard to believe that she's gone. And I know many of you have memories of her presence here. So I wanted to honor Diane for just a just a second and those memories. And um, I think it's fair to say that. She, she wasn't really melancholic. So I know that she would want us to kind of get started and, and hear what Rod Roderick Ferguson uh, has to say. Um, highly accomplished, uh, he is the William Robertson Co. Professor of Wim Women's Gender and Sexuality mm. Studies at Yale University. Incredibly prolific, uh, the author of six books and, and, and counting. Roderick Ferguson is a, theory, a theorist of race and sexuality and the component and and the ways they are produced and deployed for racism, sexism, and homophobia. He is also a theorist of uh, heterogeneity. For Ferguson, heterogeneity is the unpredictable arrangements of difference and the web of restrictions and possibilities capitalism creates as external and internal forces. As I understand it, the project of Ferguson's. Uh, is to attend to heterogeneity as it holds the potential for living and imagining eros without the displacements of rupture as pathology onto racial differences and queer sexualities, displacements that are often used to define the boundaries of the normal and the natural. In his first book, really a classic now uh, from 2004, Aberrations in Black Toward a Queer of Color Critique, Ferguson outlines and practices an analytic mode that follows how, quote, racist practices articulate as gender and sexual regulation and where gender and sexual differences variegate racial formation. Ferguson performs this critique, as he explains, in order to, quote, shed light on the ruptural, 
ruptural components of culture, components that expose the restrictions of universality, the exportations of capital, and the deceptions of national culture. In aberrations, it is women of color and black feminists, black lesbian feminisms, a touchstone of his work, that are models for seeing the ruptural components of culture as it refutes the heterosexual patriarchy at the heart of nation formation. For Ferguson, these, these social movements, the theories, ways of being know and show how we are embodied, embedded in capitalism and imperialism. And like, there's no fantasy of purity in this work, I think. Uh, um, and represent culture and nation as, quote, constructed, imaginative, and uh, heterogeneous. So there's that word again. Citing the uh, Kambahi River Collective at length, Ferguson evokes the poetics of their negations and their ability to address capitalism and, imper and imperialism as, quote, processes that were formed according to the differences of class, race, and sexuality. In a formulation I particularly like, Ferguson goes on to explain how global capital creates and reifies these differences. He, he states, rather than naming a process that crushes difference in particularity, globalization describes the formation of economic modes from which critical differences burgeon and normativity incubates. There's a real poetry there. Uh, imagining, finding, and staying with the ways of being um, from these uh, uh, black feminisms that differ from these differences and the restricted notions of the normal that, that um, they allow to grow. This is what Ferguson's work values and models. Uh, with a shrewd and generous attention to the multiple, shifting, and unpredictable reverberations of the fact that processes of racial formation require sexual subjugation and vice versa, Ferguson refuses the appetite of the dominant and its ability to offer images of the political that commodify and, and dilute the impulse for change. This means untangling contradictions of nationalism and aberrations, the university and, its prom and the promises of recognition it, it offers, the, dis the disciplines of sociology and American studies, historic protests, Stonewall is the focus of one-dimensional queer, and of course, race and sexuality as gender categories. The gentle untangling Ferguson performs does not allow these en entities to become discrete and un uncontested ready-mades, but reveals them to be formulations in flux, dense with contradictions, written by a chorus of movements, collaborations, and dialogues as they are pulled by the turning wheels of cons consequence and pushed by desire. His talk today is uh, Tony Cade Bambara, Feminist Theory and Super Patriarchy. Please join me in welcoming Roderick Ferguson. Okay. All right. Um, thanks to Kimberly Lamb for that thorough introduction. I was like, that guy sounds really interesting. <laughs> uh, <laughs> My thanks to Jolie Alcott, um, Jen Nash, and the members of the Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies program for this invitation. Happy 16th birthday. Um, I'd like to use this talk to think about a contemporary errand that feminist theory might run. But to do so, it will necessarily have to turn back to errands that it has already started. Let me begin with an essay that the black feminist writer and filmmaker Tony K. Bambara wrote in 1993, an essay entitled Language and the Writer. I've taught this essay many times and consulted very often when thinking about the role of the independent film movement as a social formation that was trying to subvert the received codes of US cinema and of US social ideologies in general. I have appreciated Umbara's vision for what a radical, multicultural cinema could be and do. That said, I continue to be drawn even more to the essay's opening lines for different purposes now. She begins, I want to talk about language, form, and changing the world. The question that faces billions of people at this moment, one decade shy of the 21st century is, can the planet be rescued from the psychopaths? 
Umbara uses this opening to signal that the stakes of language and cultural work, whether applied to literature or to cinema, are enormously large. And it seems to me that because of this heft, it can be applied to many things. Bambara must have known this as well, hence she applied it to the very particular work of cultural production. But for the moments that I have, I'd like to use it to chart a task for feminist theory that I believe is urgently necessary for this worrisome historical juncture. When Bambara wrote the essay, several alarming events had already occurred, and many more were on the horizon. There was the Iran-Contra scandal from 1985 to 1987. There was the HIV-AIDS epidemic of the 80s and Ronald Reagan's refusal to acknowledge it until 1987, six years after the first reported cases. There was the Willie Horton ad in which George H.W. Bush mobilized white voters by dog whistling about black lawlessness. In 1989, the Tiananmen Square massacre occurred. There was also the Gulf War that started in 1990, and then the beating of Rodney King in 1991. Let's assume that Bambara had these events and leaders in mind when she referred to the psychopaths who were endangering the planet. Let's also assume that her question is one that we can extend into our moment. In doing so, we might use the question to pose another set of questions. What are the psychopathic relations that jeopardize the planet in this moment, 20 plus years into the new century. Moreover, we might return to feminist theory to see these jeopardies as the culmination of patriarchal pathologies that spew their toxicities across global terrains, toxicities that attempt to make the antisocial the norm of social relations, toxicities promoted by billionaires and political leaders that command the world's attention. As such, we might understand our task as clarifying the social formations unleashed by what we might call the super patriarch. Just a quick perusal of the urgencies of our moment yield catastrophes that cross social and national boundaries. There's the climate disaster brought on largely by fossil fuel production. There's the rise of authoritarian movements and, in, and regimes in the global now, north and the global south. There's the astonishing and growing gap between the wealthy and everyone else. There's the violent suppression of social justice movements here and abroad. There's the proliferation of nuclear weapons. There's the violence associated with occupation. There's also the election of right-wing political leaders to major offices. There's the organized campaign to target trans people, particularly young people. There's the attack on reproductive freedoms. All these things amplify Bambara's question. I don't know if she read Hervé Cleckley's 1941 book, The Mask of Sanity, an attempt to clarify some issues about the so-called psychopathic personality, or if she was simply drawing on the everyday use of the category psychopath. In any case, his description works well enough for our purposes. In that text, he said the psychopathic personality was expressed by someone who seemed normal and rational on the outside, but who internally lacked coherence and fostered antisocial and destructive behavior. Bambara's argument, though, recasts the psychopath from private terrains and repositions him onto the world stage. In this sense, the psychopath becomes someone who does not simply disrupt the lives of those in their limited circumstance, circum circumference, but impacts countless people, pointing to not just patriarchal, but super patriarchal figures. Super patriarchal because their influence reaches far beyond the space of the household to K through 12 education, colleges and universities, other national territories, the environment, the embodiment of fellow human beings, and the welfare of the planet. As a result, Bambara's statement compels us to look for the psychopath, not only in the figure of the individual, but in the social formations that they unleash. Put simply, her charge requires us to determine the subject and social formations in our moment that are given to psychopathy, the practices that are made to seem rational, 
even as they destroy lives and freedoms. Certain super patriarchal figures are brought into stark relief, the world leader and the billionaire in particular, but they are simply metonyms for particular antisocial formations, deregulation, environmental devastation, nuclear proliferation, and so on. Each of these psychopathic formations takes as its archetype the super patriarch, the figure, real and discursive, that commands world-changing resources and seemingly arrogates all social agency unto himself. In his 2022 book, Davos Man, How the Billionaires Devoureth the World, the economic journalist Peter Goodman profiled the Davos Man, or as he defined it, that species of human made up of the wealthiest, most powerful people on earth who used their resources during the pandemic to shield themselves from its ravages, buying up real estate and stock at the cheapest prices, using their lobbyists to convince governments to mobilize taxpayers' monies for corporate bailouts, maneuvering healthcare and pharmaceutical systems to maximize profits from people's miseries. According to Goodman, Davos Mann constructs himself as the world's superhero, as the billionaire CEO and philanthropist of the software company Salesforce, Mark Benioff put it at the 2021 World Economic Forum, quote, in the pandemic, it was CEOs in many, many cases all over the world who were the heroes. They're the ones who stepped forward with their financial resources and their corporate resources, their employees, their factories, and pivoted rapidly, not for profit, but to save the world, end quote. For Benioff, the billionaire is the presumed social and mor moral agent par excellence, mobilizing his goodwill and riches to produce a presumably altruistic version of capitalism. While focusing on particular billionaires, Goodman suggests that the billionaire is also an ideological force. He has insinuated into our politics and culture what we may call the cosmic lie, he says, the alluring yet demonstrably bogus idea that cutting taxes and deregulating markets will not only produce extra riches for the most affluent, but trickle the benefits down to the lucky masses, something that has in real life happened zero times, <laughs> end quote. As a figure that shows up in political and social culture, the billionaire is more than any actual individual, but is a social archetype that shapes social discourses, policies, identities, and practices. While the theory of trickle-down economics claim to be a way of achieving social responsibility, by looking out not only for the wealthy, but for the middle and lower classes as well, its origins were explicitly anti-social and anti-public. For instance, in his 1970 New York Times article, The Social Responsibility of Business is to Increase Profits, the economist and Nobel laureate Milton Friedman argued, quote, in either case, the key point is that in his capacity as a corporate executive, the manager is the agent of the individuals who own the corporation or establish the elomocenary institution, and his primary responsibility is to them, end quote. Here, Friedman tried to shift corporate conversations away from the social world and its publics and toward the welfare of the shareholders. For Friedman, the discourse of social responsibility confused necessary distinctions between the executive as private person and the executive as corporate being. As he said, quote, of course, the corporate executive is also a person in his own right. As a person, he may have many other responsibilities that he recognizes or assumes voluntary to his family, his conscience, his feelings of charity, his church, his clubs, his city, his country. He may feel impelled by these responsibilities to devote part of his income to causes he regards as worthy, to refuse to work for particular corporations, even to leave his job, for example, to join his country's armed forces. 
if we wish, we may refer to some of these responsibilities as social responsibilities, end quote. Here, Friedman argued that these actions involve the preferences of the private individual, but they were not to be confused with the duties of the corporate being who manages the preferences of shareholders. As he said, quote, but in these respects, he is acting as a principal, not an agent. He is spending his own money or time or energy, not the money of his employers or the time or energy he is contracted to devote to their purposes. If these are social responsibilities, they are the social responsibilities of individuals, not business, end quote. Here, the shareholder is understood necessarily to have no social responsibilities, and it is the job of the executive to fulfill the antisocial world presumably demanded by the shareholder. Friedman implied that this antisocial world was the world as it should be, the normative preference of a market society. He said, for instance, quote, whether blameworthy or not, the use of the cloak of social responsibility and the nonsense spoken in its name by influential and prestigious businessmen does clearly harm the foundations of a free society, end quote. A free society, he implied, is therefore an antisocial society. This is why he could sum up the business world as having only one narrow commitment, the accumulation of wealth. As he put it, quote, I have called it a fundamentally subversive doctrine in a free society and have said that in such a society, there is, on, there is one and only one social responsibility of business to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits so long as it stays within the rules of the game, which is to say, engages in open and free competition without deception or fraud, end quote. Friedman's argument about social responsibility trickled down to political culture in the US and Britain. In a 1986 press conference, then President Ronald Reagan said, quote, I've always felt the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> and in 1987, his British counterpart, Margaret Thatcher said, quote, I think we have gone through a period when too many children and people have been given to understand I have a problem. It is the government's job to cope with it. Or I have a problem. I will go and get a grant to cope with it. I am homeless. The government must house me. And so they are casting their problems on society. And who is society? There is no such thing. There are individual men and women, and there are families. And no government can do anything except through people and people look to themselves first, end quote. It is significant here that Thatcher redefines personhood away from its assumed social roots. A real person, according to her, is someone who turns away from notions of the public and its social institutions. It is not simply that she said there is no thing as society. She also implied there is no such thing as a social being. This construction of the person as someone who rejects the social and rejects relationality is absolutely crucial for a corporate and social ethos that can legitimately be called psychopathic. <laughs> who knows all that Bumbar meant when she invoked the crisis to our planet. But certainly in our day, the threat of environmental disaster and nuclear devastation qualifies. In fact, by evacuating social concerns from policy and subjecthood, opportunities were created for Earth's corporate devastation. Take, for instance, the issue of nuclear weapons. In her chapter, Peace is a Sister's Issue, Afro-American Women and the Campaign Against Nuclear Arms, from the 1984 volume, Women, Culture, and Politics, Angela Davis wrote, quote, if it is true, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, 
that a nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death, then our country has died spiritually many times over since the advent of the Reagan administration, end quote. Davis pointed out the role that tax inequalities play in this nuclear reality, writing, quote, some of the country's largest military contractors pay absolutely no federal income. Lockheed, General Electric, Boeing, and General Dynamics between 1981 and 1983, even though they had combined profits totaling $10 billion. Some of these companies even managed to get money back from the government, end quote. Davis suggested here that by relieving the weapons manufacturers of any tax burden, the government underwrote our nuclear nightmare. But perhaps more importantly, the American public underwrote it as well. As she stated, quote, over 60 cents of each income tax dollar go to the Pentagon. A person who earns $22,000 a year will have given an entire year's salary to the Pentagon between 1985 and 1989, all for the production of more MX missiles, more Trident and cruise missiles, and for further research and development of the st strategic defense initiative popularly known as Star Wars, end quote. Um, those of us in the room um, are old enough to remember Star Wars, <laughs> not the movie, but this thing. In this assessment, we have what we may consider a retake of Marx's argument in the fetishism of the commodity and its secret. There, Marx argued that the commodity form had overtaken social relations and suppressed knowledge of how it amplifies and normalizes labor exploitation. Here, the secret of tax displacements onto the public is that they foster the conditions for looming disasters that would destroy the public. Put simply, because of decades of tax policies, the public is enlisted in the psychopathic project. In his discussion of defense spending, the late political theorist Iqbal Ahmad also argued, quote, during this period of 1947 to 1970, the United States spent 50 times more money on its military operations in underdeveloped countries than on its so-called economic aid to them. At the same time, its investments abroad grew from $7.2 billion in 1947 to more than $60 billion in 1970. The Pentagon and the armaments industry collaborated to make the United States the biggest merchant of death in the third world. $11 billion in the U in United States arms sales to the third world in 1975, end quote. The status of the U.S. as a weapons distributor, in other words, is underwritten by the private sphere of the home. The distressing climate disaster is also another area in which we can see the relations of the psychopath. Consider, for instance, the revelations that ExxonMobil knowingly suppressed the effects of fossil fuel production. Discovering internal memos in 2015, investigative reporters uncovered that ExxonMobil understood in the 1970s that fossil fuel production would lead to global warming and change the world's landscape before 2050. Additional documents also revealed that the largest trade association for the US oil and gas industry knew what the effects of fossil fuels would be since the 1950s at least, and that electric utilities, Total Oil Company, GM, and Ford Motor Companies were aware of this since the 1970s. But as the scientists, Jeffrey Supran, Naomi Oreskes, and Stefan Romstorff have recently argued, the truth is even more damning than what the journalists uncovered. As the scientist said, quote, our findings demonstrate that ExxonMobil didn't just know something about global warming decades ago. They knew as much as academic and government scientists knew 
But whereas those scientists worked to communicate what they knew, ExxonMobil worked to deny it, including overemphasizing uncertainties, denigrating climate models, mythologizing global cooling, feigning ignorance about the discernibility of human-caused warming, and staying silent about the possibility of stranded fossil fuel assets in a carbon-constrained world." End quote. In its active suppression of research, ExxonMobil was fulfilling Friedman's argument to the letter. As far as its managers were concerned, the only social responsibility that the corporation had was to its own profits. It had no moral responsibility to, pres to preserve social well-being. Exxon was so committed to profit making that it obfuscated climate research and knowingly helped to bring about our present day climate disaster. And in as much as it flouted the welfare of life on this planet, it proved itself to be the, co the corporate expression of Cleckley's psychopath. The climate disaster links to the nuclear threat as well. The physician, writer, and member of International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, Matt Bevins, writes in a report entitled, Nuclear Famine, Even a Limited Nuclear War Would Cause Abrupt Climate Disruption and Global Starvation. He writes, a so-called limited or regional nuclear war would be neither limited nor regional. On the contrary, it would be a planetary scale event. In fact, it would be far more dangerous than we understood even a few years ago. A war that detonated less than 1 20th of the world's nuclear weapons would still crash the climate, the global food supply chains, and likely public order. Famines and unrest would kill hundreds of millions, perhaps even billions." End quote. We can trace the absurd notion of a limited or regional nuclear war to the US flying aces of World War I, interestingly enough. As Linda Robbins, Robertson argued in The Dream of Civilized Warfare, World War I, flying aces, and the American imagination, the idea of a clean, limited, and civilized version of war was an ideology that emerged as war was taken to the air by pilots who were constructed as the Renaissance men of the military. Unsullied by the horrors of ground warfare, the World War I flying aces were proof that war could be waged in the lofty regions of the sky and executed through gentlemanly ideals. But as soldiers flew above, bombs were dropped below creating a situation in which the main casualties of war since the Second World War have been civilians, primarily women and children. As Bevins argues, the restraint implied in limited nuclear war belies the reality of the perilousness that is in fact close at hand. As he said, quote, large portions of world Nuclear arsenals remain poised for launch within minutes. In response to computer warnings suggesting an incoming attack, this practice has been various, variously labeled as keeping weapons on high alert status, launch on warning status, or hair trigger alert. In the United States, hair trigger alert has long been criticized as reckless and dangerous, not just by academics or peace activists, but in fact by many who have served at the very pinnacle of the national security state." End quote. The hair trigger alert is not only an indictment of how world destruction has become automated, it is also an indictment of the dangerous prerogatives of world leaders. In her book, Bad for Democracy, How the Presidency Undermines the Power of the People, Dana Nelson directs our attention to the figure of the U.S. Commander-in-Chief, the one who presides over the U.S. military industrial complex. She writes, quote, the mystique of the Commander-in-Chief encourages citizens to feel secure in regular life as it exacts their ever less questioning loyalty. 
insofar as we subscribe to the idea that the president is our commander in chief, we reimagine American democracy through the lens of the military, not egalitarian, but hierarchical. A command where accountability flows upward, not downward to the citizens, now reconceived as rank and file." End quote. Nelson offers this quote from the first George Bush as an example. She states, quote, President George W. Bush relied on this logic when he explained to Bob Woodard, I'm the commander, see, I don't need to explain, maybe it's the second Bush. That's the interesting thing about being president. Maybe somebody needs to explain to me why they say something, but I don't feel like I owe anybody any explanation, end quote. As a figure, the commander in chief requires an Oedipal identification from the citizenry. The commander will take care of the nation as a father does. For our purposes, it is important to acknowledge that the super patriarch is not simply the object of critique. It is also a powerful object of identification and subjectification. The theorist Norma Alorcon 30 years ago in her article, The Theoretical Subjects of This Bridge Call My Back, tried to bring our attention to the fact that the patriarch was not only an object of identification for cis cisgender men, but for certain strands within feminism as well. As she stated, quote, though feminism has problematized gender relations, it has not problematized the subject of knowledge and her complicity with the notion of consciousness as synthetic unificatory power, the center and active point of organization of representing, of rep organization of representations determining their concatenation. The subject and object of knowledge is now a woman, but the inherited view of consciousness has not been questioned at all." End quote. Her text, like that of Bambara's, represents unfinished business. Carceral feminism, bourgeois feminism, Anglo-American feminism, anti-trans feminism, all inherit this view of consciousness and illustrate that feminism may not have performed the deep reckoning that she called for. Combined with Bambara's prophetic warning, Alarcon's theorization of the patriarch as the basis of unlikely identifications and subjectifications is needed now more than ever. In 1980, Bambara's novel, The Salt Eaters, was released. The book, as Erica Edwards notes, raised the specter of nuclear annihilation. 13 years later, she would write Language and the Writer. By that time, she would have expanded her skills beyond literature to include film and media. One of the social practices that could be used in the rescue of the planet was cultural work. As Bambara said, quote, the challenge that the cultural worker faces, myself, for example, as a writer and as a media activist, is that the tools of my trade are colonized. The creative imagination has been colonized, and the audience, readers, and writers is in bondage to an industry. It has the money, the will, the muscle, and the propaganda machine oiled up to keep us all locked into a delusional system." End quote. For the cultural worker, being part of the rescue means doing what the cultural worker does in a Gramscian sense, elaborating and diffusing conceptions of the world. As Bambara argued, quote, the independent filmmaker who may not have any particular agenda who may not even have coherent politics, but simply wishes to tell a story, discovers all too soon that the very conventions, the very tools, practices in which that filmmaker has been trained were not designed to accommodate her or his story, her or his people, her or his cultural heritage, her or his issues. And that filmmaker will then face a choice either to devise a new film language in order to get that story told, or to have the whole enterprise derailed 
by these conventions, end quote. Earlier this year, the College Board announced that it had excised certain areas from its AP African American Studies course proposal because they were too theoretical. Those areas were feminism, queerness, and the critiques of state violence and capitalist formations. Not coincidentally, the Florida Department of Education's words, not mine, the DeSantis administration called for the excision of certain areas from the course because they smacked of indoctrination. Those areas were feminism, queerness, and the critiques of state violence and capitalist formations. These areas have been the sites of the most committed deliberations around what it means to expand our understandings of the social and the relational. Because of the actions of a normative African American studies and a right wing campaign against critical education, we are witnessing a historical juncture that is unprecedented. Put in Bambara's language, this is an instance in which the whole enterprise can be derailed by canonicity on the one hand and fascism on the other. Hence, we are in a dire historical moment in which ostensibly progressive formations are converging with authoritarian ones over even the possibility of social and relational analytics. In terms of feminist theory, it is necessary to reclaim theory as a site for illuminating psychopathic formations and for devising even newer ways for understanding how sociality and relationality are the basis of social practice. For the cultural worker and the theorist, this is the only way to disrupt the psychopathic thrust of the social world. And in this, we may come to know what Bambara understood so well that the question of whether we do this critical and imaginative work may determine whether the whole world is won or lost. Thank you. <laughs>